welcome. Uh, my name is Jama Best and I'm the Executive Director of the Arkansas Humanities Council. And uh, we are thrilled to have you guys join us this evening for one of, in a series of our We the People um, Public Teacher Seminar Series. Uh, tonight, we have a special guest with us, Dr. Paul Babbitt. Uh, he is Associate Professor and Chair of the, of the History, Political Science and Geography Department at Southern Arkansas University of Magnolia. Uh, he's been um, teaching at the university for over 20 years and he received his PhD in political science from Rutgers University. Uh, and he is also uh, on the Arkansas Humanities Council board and executive committee has been for six years and uh, we are so thankful to have uh, Dr. Babbitt joining us this evening, and I think you're going to really enjoy his presentation tonight. So, um, Dr. Babbitt, uh, I'd like to turn it over to you now, and thanks so much for being with us this evening. Oh, well, thank you. I'm really uh, excited to do this and share what I can. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about the, the title, and, and I'll be honest, um, I kind of came up with the title completely on the fly during that phone conversation. Uh, I was having with with uh, Ann Clements. Um, it just sort of popped into my head, and I, 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 if I have any real talent, it is a talent of coming up with kind of grabby, headliney uh, titles, and and this is definitely one. But uh, the title really does reflect how I want to try to approach uh, this topic of states. Um, I'm not even exactly sure. I don't exactly remember. Uh, I know it involves states and federalism. Uh, that's a big topic and it can involve a lot of different things. And I wanted to talk about it in two different ways. And the first way is the Montesquieu way. And the second way is the marijuana legalization way. And um, what you may find is that the Montesquieu way is going to be a little bit less, less familiar uh, to many of you perhaps. Um, whereas the marijuana legalization uh, is at that point, I'll bring in the whole notion of laboratories of democracy, which I think is a more common way of thinking about how states operate, the problem of uh, federal sovereignty versus state sovereignty and, and so forth. And I think those issues are, are really important, uh, but I wanted to introduce this, this Montesquieu idea, and, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I promise I'll, I'll get to that first. I also want to say a few other things. Um, as noted, I am, my PhD is in political science. I'm not a historian. Uh, and, and more than that, I'm a political theorist. So I'm not terribly concerned about facts, really, uh, or uh, details. Um, I'm, I'm not a detail person. I'm a, more of a big picture person. My concerns are really about how we can understand, as a political scientist, how we can understand our current politics. And to me, the central question is always, when we think about politics, is what's at stake? Right. Why are we worried about this? Why are we concerned about this? Why is this um, an important uh, issue for us to consider? And, and I think there's a great deal at stake uh, in, in what I have to present. I also want to say I do think, although, like I said, I am a political scientist, not a historian, um, I think history has a lot to offer our understanding of politics, uh, provided we do it correctly. Which brings me to, I think, a, a real problem I have with, and this is something that I think historians are, are really good about or should be good about, and, and people who are more focused on the here and now in politics tend to get wrong. Um, the terms we use to describe our political differences today, and you know, I'll just throw out liberal and conservative um, as, as an important one, uh, aren't really terms that we can easily project far back in time. Um, our own current political disagreements, uh, tensions or whatever are not necessarily those of the past. Indeed, I would say, and I've thought about this at some length, the very notion of liberal and conservative don't really make sense until at least the 19th century um, and, and maybe not even then. So we have to be really careful, right? We can't say, I don't think uh, with any great confidence, at least without really good textual support that say James Madison would have favored this or that Alexander Hamilton would, make, would have been against that. We just 
don't have that information, right? We just don't know enough about their thinking. I mean, sometimes if they said specifically, we, we would know, but other in many cases, we can't say, again, specifically, uh, would say James Madison had been in favor of uh, having states decide to legalize marijuana or not. I, I don't think we can we can say that with any confidence. Um, so, so I think that's a, that's another really important point, right? It's also important to keep in mind that we do, in some respect, share a language, a political language, with um, the framers. But we often use words in different ways, and we also have to be aware of that. So, like I said, this is all kind of coming back to the notion that I am a political theorist, uh, but I am very uh, sensitive and attentive to trying to understand exactly how the people who wrote these words use them and what they meant by it. Okay. And that's part of what this is about, because Madison, I think, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Madison and, and his contrast with Montesquieu to start with. Madison, I think, changes our political language in some interesting and important ways. Um, Madison elevated a particular understanding of liberty that I think is at odds with the understanding of liberty that many of his contemporaries shared. Now, he didn't invent it. Um, this this conception, conception of liberty, I think, goes back at least to a political philosopher of the 17th century, uh, Thomas Hobbes. Um, but a lot of his contemporaries thought about this differently. Uh, so let's talk about, let me, let me, uh, one, one, one last sort of preliminary thing I want, I want to make sure everyone uh, understands at least uh, in terms of my own perspective coming from this. Um, the Constitution, and I'm thinking a lot, and, and in, present, in, you know, in preparing this, I'm really focusing in the first part of this discussion, uh, the debate concerning the Constitution. Uh, I think too often, you know, in political discourse, we are presented with the idea that there are these guys, they're the founding fathers, and they all, you know, wore wigs, and they all agreed about everything. And of course, uh, one doesn't have to read very deeply into the controversies to recognize they, they didn't agree about much of anything. Indeed, um, there's at least some argument that Washington resigns after his second term precisely because he didn't like dealing with all of the vicious uh, political debates that he was you know, witnessing. Um, but going back to the Constitution um, and, and how it relates to states, under the Articles of Confederation, states had um, states had the balance of power, right? They had more power than the federal government. The federal government didn't have the power to directly raise taxes. They didn't really have the power to raise a military. Um, and so, so the Articles of Confederation were the government you'd want if you thought states should be supreme. And so what the constitution does is it strengthens the federal government. And this is obvious when you begin to read uh, the debates. Right now, I have here, and I'll probably talk about this later on, right? A lot of people read the Federalist Papers. The Federalist Papers are very important, um, and we still pay attention to them today. But of course, uh, the Federalist Papers were not written in a vacuum. They were written to respond to specific arguments that were brought up against ratification of the Constitution. Uh, and that's another important piece of the context. And I'll talk about a couple of uh, important Federalist Papers in a moment, but they're political documents. They're political. They're editorials. They were they were written for in a newspaper to try to convince the people of New York to ratify the Constitution. But it was clear that Madison and Hamilton and the other framers of the Constitution believed that we needed a stronger, more powerful federal government than what we had under the Ar Articles of Confederation. But they also knew that people cared a great deal about their state governments. And the question is why? And this is where Montesquieu comes in. And I'm going to, I'm, I'm not a big PowerPoint person, but I put this quote up on a slide. And so I'm going to share it with you. And the quote is this, right? Uh, this is from Montesquieu, Spirit of the Laws, Book 8, Chapter 16. Now, 
Montesquieu's spirit of the laws is incredibly influential. Montesquieu comes up with all kinds of uh, important ideas where he synthesizes a lot of ideas uh, that were um, going around Europe. And when we think about Montesquieu as he and as, as the spirit of the laws relates to the constitution, we typically think about the three branches of government, right? Because Montesquieu described how they would work, right? You have your executive, your legislative and your judicial branch. Um, prior to Montesquieu, actually, most people thought about this in terms of two branches of government, right? The, the judicial branch kind of wasn't a separate branch. It was just the legislative and the executive. Montesquieu adds that third uh, and obviously very important branch. But, but let me read the quote to you uh, and, and sort of break it down a little bit. It is natural for a republic to have only a small territory. Otherwise, it cannot long subsist. In an extensive republic, there are men of large fortunes and consequently, consequently of less moderation. There are trusts too considerable to be placed in any single subject. He has interests of his own. He soon begins to think that he may be happy and glorious by oppressing his fellow citizens and that he may raise himself to grandeur on the ruins of his country. In an extensive Republic, the public good is sacrificed to a thousand private views. It is subordinate to exceptions and depends on accidents. In a small one, the interest of the public is more obvious better understood and more within the reach of every citizen. Abuses have a less extent and of course are less protected. So this is what I'm really interested in. Why would Montesquieu think a small Republic be more functional than a Republic in a large territory? Now he has some history to draw on, right? The collapse of the Roman Republic was part of what's operating in, in Montesquieu's mind. But I want to suggest a few other things that are going on here, right? Um, men of large fortunes. Well, of course, you could have men of large fortunes in a smaller republic, but generally, right, the, the belief was that a smaller republic meant the larger fortunes wouldn't be quite so large. Um, small republics are going to be less diverse, and that's math, right? The bigger the, the bigger the place is, the more diversity you have, the more interests you have, the more uh, differences of opinion. And so in a small republic, in a small homogenous republic, what Montesquieu is saying, we can more easily recognize the common good. We have more in common with one another and therefore we would be more willing to sacrifice for that public good. Um, and, and this is what almost everybody believed in 1787. That the pr one big problem with a federal government would be that it would threaten our liberty and also threaten any notion of our ability to sacrifice for the common good. What do the what do the people of Rhode Island have in common with the people of South Carolina that would make them equally likely to sacrifice for the other's good? Now, Hamilton and Madison are well aware of this. Um, and so they Hamilton in Federalist number nine, right, Federalism number nine, I should have written Federalist there, uh, writes that when Montesquieu recommends this a small extent for republics, the standard he has in mind were of dimensions far short of the limits uh, of almost every one of these states. Neither Virginia, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, New York, North Carolina, nor Georgia can be by means compared with the models from which he reasoned uh, and to which term his description his applies. This of course uh, is, uh, an important point also uh, to always keep in mind, right? Small and large are, of course, relative terms. Um, the nation, the United States today, of course, is much larger than the United States of uh, 1787, both in terms of land area and population. And I'm not sure how many, uh, I know that we have uh, a lot of school teachers here. I'm not sure how many of you, um, probably most of you do remember uh, when, when uh, Governor Huckabee uh, tried to consolidate school districts uh, back in the early uh, 2000s. Um, and, you know, I was new to the state at that time and I wasn't quite, and I was learning uh, things about Arkansas. And one of the things I learned about Arkansas is that the Arkansan idea of a large school is not the same as the idea of a large school pretty much anywhere else in the country, right? Uh, according to Arkans, our, our, many Arkansans think that a school like uh, our local school, Magnolia, uh, with a graduating class of around 200 is a large school. And 
uh, in New Jersey that would be considered a small, medium small school. Um, so, and I think the same thing uh, can be found here. And so what, what Hamilton simply pointing out is that when M Montesquieu talks about small, he doesn't mean Virginia small, he means, well, we can just use Madison's County, Orange County small. Um, one of the things that the image might be um, the town meeting. Uh, even in a town, say, the size of Magnolia, a town meeting is going to become unwieldy pretty quickly, right? D direct democracy uh, requires far smaller political units than even a town these days. So that's an important thing that, that Hamilton is pointing out here. Uh, but there's still this important problem of diversity, right? Because it is still the case that Virginia, let's say, doesn't have a whole lot of in common with New York. And this is what Hamilton figures out. And this is why Federalist 10 is so critically important. And, you know, when I was preparing this talk, um, I was thinking a lot about, I knew I wanted to include Federalist 10. You can't talk about this topic without including Federalist 10. But I wasn't sure what parts of Federalist tend to include. And in some respects, I wanted to include pretty much all of it. And that wasn't really a good idea. So I, I didn't do that. But I pulled out a few quotes. And I have my copy in front of me in case uh, some of you have some questions here. But of course, the famous thing, the famous part of Federalist 10 is this definition of faction. And um, he says, of course, by a faction, I understand a number of citizens, whether amounting to a majority or minority of the whole, who are united and actuated by some common impulse of passion or of interest, adverse to the rights of other citizens or to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. I, I skip a bunch of texts. The influence of factious leaders may kindle a flame within their particular states, but will be unable to spread a general conflagration through other states. So this, I think, is to me really fascinating because Madison in effect has turned Montesquieu on its head, right? Montesquieu says only liberty in a small state, only liberty can only really exist where we have more or less uh, conformity, um, homogeneity. And Madison says, no, you, you've got this all wrong. Really what's gonna protect our freedom is diversity. And, it's very clear if you read the rest of the text of Federalist 10, what Madison is really talking about is diversity in terms of our economic interests. Um, what Madison, especially Hamilton also, what many of them are worried about are what would people who have a lot of debt, I'm gonna stop the share at this point. Well, I'm gonna try to stop the share and there we go. Um, what would people who have a lot of, people who are in debt, indebted farmers, let's say, share an economic interest. And there's nothing to prevent them to, from taking over uh, and dominating a small political unit. But in a large country, farmers don't form a majority and they can't, they just aren't enough of them. Um, the inability of groups to get together and do something that's harmful uh, to the interests of the whole simply is much less likely. And so we have liberty, but it's a very, it's a different kind of liberty than what Montesquieu is talking about. I think, I think uh, Montesquieu really means liberty in the sense of self-government, right? Elsewhere, he defines liberty as acting under the law, acting freely under the law. Um, you know, I, I, I have students, you have students, uh, most of my students, and I would guess your students are the same, uh, believe that any restriction on doing what they want to do is a restriction of their liberty. Uh, that whatever the law might be, um, it's even if they don't want to violate the law, that, that limits their liberty, right? Speed limits, parking regulations, well, and of course, as we'll find out soon enough, marijuana laws, right? Limit their liberty. But for Montesquieu, and, and, that's, and that's Madison's idea, right? Madison doesn't really believe that people are capable, I guess, of governing themselves. But that's what, that's what Montesquieu had in mind. By governing ourselves, we become free. If we are making the laws, I mean, sort of think about it, if you as an individual are giving yourself a law, 
right? You know, it's it's the new year. Some of us, I have. Some of us may have made a resolution. Um, I resolved to, uh, I have actually resolved to try to do some exercise every day. Many days I don't feel like exercising, but uh, so far I've been pretty good about it. I've been, I've been doing it. I've been doing at least a little bit of exercise every day. Am I free or not free when I do something because I thought on January 1st, it was a good idea to do this? The question's a little bit absurd, right? Of course, I'm making the decision. No one's forcing me to do it. But what if we make the decision as a group? We will find that kind of decision much less burdensome if everybody in our group is kind of like us. Uh, if you and your friends all have the same taste in movies and you decide to choose what movie you're going to go see by majority vote, chances are everybody's going to be happy. If you and your friends have very different tastes in movies, um, you might find that say, well, you guys go see Spider-Man. I'm, I'm not really interested in, in that kind of thing. And so Madison has really flipped all of this on its head, right? He has basically said, no, forget about making the laws or whatever. As long as you can be left alone, as long as we're going to prevent groups from getting together and, and violating your interests, um, you'll be free. There's a, there's a, what, what I think they really sort of have in mind is a sort of, if we can make the rules such that people by, by simply looking out for their, themselves will end up doing something positive is what, and it's, and it's, it's, it's definitely um, influenced by Adam Smith and the wealth, wealth of nations and the whole idea of an invisible hand, right? The butcher, the baker, they don't go to work to make bread to feed people, they go to work to make bread to sell it to make money. Okay. So let's go, how does this all tie in with the marijuana? This raises a number of issues uh, important to political theorists. One of them is the relationship between liberty and democracy. Um, democracy makes us free because we participate in making the laws. Um, I'm going to have to skip ahead, I guess, if I want to get to some of this stuff. Um, and I've kind of talked about a lot of it. Anyway, because think about marijuana for a minute at the level of the states. Um, one of the interesting things about marijuana, and I actually, I actually looked this up, and I'm, I am skipping around now, but where did I, I know I wrote this down. So states have different marijuana. Okay, yeah, here. Okay, so states have different marijuana laws, right? Um, and and you know this. Arkansas has legal medical marijuana. Some of our neighbors don't. Um, a handful of states, uh, I think, now um, have have recreation have legalized recreational marijuana. Eighteen states at last kind of legalized recreational marijuana. There's something really interesting uh, that one notices because uh, when states that have legalized marijuana medical marijuana, like Arkansas, uh, that's 32, if I'm doing the math right. 32 states have medical marijuana of some kind. 19 of those states, it required voters uh, to, to uh, and this was the case in Arkansas, right? Signatures were put the uh, issue on a ballot. Voters had an opportunity to vote yes or no. Uh, happened in Arkansas twice. First time it didn't pass, second time it passed, and, and passed pretty comfortably. Um, when it comes to recreational marijuana, legal now in 18 states, 13 were done by voters and five by state legislatures. So what does this mean and how is this related to Madison? Well, what it means is I think that states have different cultures, right? Some states are socially conservative, some states are less socially conservative. And when voters have an opportunity to express that culture, they, they do so. Um, by the way, it's, it's, it is also interesting uh, that lots and lots of states, including Arkansas, are trying to put it the recreational marijuana on the ballot, right? This is one of those ideas uh, that seems to um, be coming pretty quickly. Um, so there's all kinds of reasons for this. If you're an elected uh, official, there's you, you probably make a political calculation. I could support 
voting for legalization of marijuana, but I don't want to put a lot of effort into getting it on the ballot and convincing other legislators to do it. So it becomes a kind of grassroots um, issue. And we see that states that have um, referendum, like Arkansas, often have different politics uh, and different political than, than states that would seem to be similar uh, than states that don't have referendum. Uh, another obvious place you can see this, I think, is minimum wage. Arkansas has an $11 an hour minimum wage now. Uh, most of our neighbors don't. And one reason for that is that we have, uh, again, minimum wage law, uh, our increase in the minimum wage was also a referendum. But marijuana raises another important issue here, and that's the laboratories of democracy. But it also uh, looks at, of course, the challenge and the tension between state law and federal law. Right? So marijuana, as I said before, is medically legal in 32 states, recreational in 18 states. But of course, it remains illegal at the federal level. So if you're in, say, Colorado, is marijuana legal or illegal? Uh, you go to Colorado, and it looks like what people are doing in some cases are committing federal crimes right out in the open. And how is that possible? Well, it's kind of tricky, right? There's First of all, there, there are banking regulations that uh, make it difficult for people involved in the marijuana business from, from dealing with banks, getting loans and so forth and running their business like other businesses do. And of course, right now, um, and it's been the case for, I guess, 10, 12 years, maybe even a little bit longer than that. Uh, the, the department, the Drug Enforcement Agency, the DEA simply is not enforcing these marijuana laws that would be used to target um, state sanctioned marijuana businesses. But if, you know, uh, if you run one of those businesses, you're taking a big risk because at any time the attitude of the federal government could change. And so this is in some sense, one of the unresolved puzzles of federalism. And it, maybe it's a good thing, maybe it's a bad thing. And I'm gonna talk uh, a little bit more about a few other issues. One of the, of course, the other, one of the issues that's, that I think is also interesting and similar is alcohol. Um, the repeal of prohibition was done by constitutional amendment. Um, and the amendment that repealed prohibition had a, uh, had a provision that said states basically can do whatever they want when it comes to alcohol. They could ban it outright. So an entire state could be dry. They could, they could legalize it, license it, however they, however they chose. And if you lived in other states, you'll notice that pretty much uh, a, every state is different. And many states have weird things. Um, I've lived in three states, Arkansas, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. Arkansas, of course, is known for having lots of dry counties uh, where it's very difficult uh, to get, once it gets on the ballot, typically counties will vote to go wet, but it's extremely difficult just to get the issue on the ballot. You need, you need something like a, a substantial number of signatures of people who voted in the last county election. Um, in New Jersey, uh, you can buy beer and liquor in a liquor store, and that's it. You can't buy beer or wine in a grocery store or anything like that, convenience store. Also in New Jersey, the number of bars in a town is limited by its population. Now, you also do have dry towns in New Jersey, uh, but because a lot of these municipalities are so small, nobody, nobody really notices. Uh, another thing that you get in New Jersey as a consequence of this is a lot of what are called BYOs. So it's a restaurant. You bring your own uh, beer or wine or whatever, and they'll they'll serve it to you, um, but you brought it in yourself. Pennsylvania might be the weirdest state. Pennsylvania has what are called state-owned liquor stores. So the state has a monopoly on liquor and wine, but you cannot buy beer in a liquor store. You have to go to either a package store or a beer mart to buy beer. And when I was living in Pennsylvania, and this is a long time ago, and I think it's changed a little bit, you could only buy beer in most places by the case. You couldn't go and buy a six pack. You had to buy a case of beer in, in most places. Um, so, and you know, again, every state is different. Another uh, interesting issue um, is when the federal government wanted to raise the uh, drinking age nationally to 21. 
Constitution said they couldn't just do that, right? Con Congress could not pass a law that said every state must raise its drinking age to 21 because of prohibition, the repeal of prohibition. And so in order to, to make that happen, and I think the two states that held out the longest on this were New Hampshire and Louisiana. And to get New Hampshire and Louisiana to come along with this, they said, okay, if you don't raise your drinking age, we're going, yeah, I'm sure Utah does. Utah's laws have changed a lot recently though, right? Um, but if you don't raise your drinking age, we will withhold certain highway money from you. And uh, so that was enough of an incentive to get New Hampshire and Louisiana to raise their, their drinking age. So I would say that when it comes to things like legalization of marijuana, one of the real advantages of state sovereignty is this idea of laboratories of democracy. Um, I am not necessarily uh, a huge advocate of marijuana legalization. Um, and at the very least, I think it makes sense for say people in Arkansas and other states to see what happens in Colorado and states that have legalized it. Do they have real problems with it? Um, and once we watch how these things work in other states, we can, we can consider doing it ourselves, perhaps trying to avoid some of the mistakes they might've made uh, in, in their process. And that's the, that's the real strength of states, right? We can watch what other states do. And if what they do seems to work out, we can, we can adapt that for our own purposes. If what they do doesn't seem to work out, we can say, no, 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 we don't want any part of that. By the way, um, uh, I read another report on this. It turns out that the effects of legalizing marijuana, other than it does increase state revenue, states get a lot more money, uh, but other than that, kind of minimal, doesn't really increase very much marijuana usage or what have you. But there are other areas where states maybe aren't the best in the best position to do so. Um, the obvious one that I thought of was trucking. If you're trying to ship freight from one state to another, the last thing you wanna do is deal with new regulations every time you cross a state border. It simply makes sense. And of course the constitution has the interstate commerce provision. Congress has the authority to regulate interstate commerce. So if you're involved in interstate trucking, um, you're, you probably are happy that Congress and not every single state legislator uh, is regulating uh, your business. The one that I think is maybe, and again, I sort of thought, and this is kind of where I'm gonna end things and open it up to questions, is education. Um, education is varies a great deal from one state to the next. Um, I, I talked earlier about you know what counts as a small school. Um, people want to control locally their education system, right? When, when it comes to education, many, many people, maybe most people uh, follow Montesquieu, right? They think Montesquieu, Montesquieu's attitudes are the right ones. But is this really good for the country as a whole? Maybe Madison is right. Um, just looking at spending, for example, um, and these numbers are, are really hard to get, it turns out, with any accuracy, but I, I did the best I could. Um, New York spends twice as much per student as Utah, uh, almost two and a half times as much per Utah. Now you might say, well, that's because New York has higher cost of living, but you know, keep in mind, much of New York is pretty, pretty rural, right? There, you know, there is New York City and that's obviously a big city, but, but upstate New York is as rural as Arkansas. Um, so, that explains some of it, but not all of it. But then I realized, and then I saw this, and I thought this was fascinating. And I actually kind of dug down into it and, and tried to figure out why this was, because this didn't make any sense. Wyoming also spends almost twice as much as Utah. And if you, I mean, in many ways, Wyoming and Utah strike me as pretty similar places, right? Both pretty rural, big spread out Western states. Uh, I would imagine their political culture is pretty similar, and yet Utah spends a lot less on education than Wyoming. And I actually spend a little bit of time. One reason, uh, and again, this is where the numbers get really fuzzy, Wyoming um, spends zero local, all education funding in Wyoming is from the state. So there's no, look like, you know, when I pay my property tax and you pay your property tax, a big chunk of that goes to the school district. In Wyoming, it all comes from the state. Um, people in Wyoming defend this because they say it leads to much more, equality 
in school funding in Wyoming, right? Rich communities don't spend more than, than lower income communities. Uh, so that may be a real advantage to the way Wyoming does. Um, most every other state adds a substantial chunk of local funding to uh, uh, what they do. But my question is, is it fair or just that depending on the state a child lives in will depend on the amount of resources available to that child's education. Uh, and, and that's, so I don't have, um, I think that's how I want to end it, right? I've, 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 I've sort of taken up the, the allotted time that I was told I had. I actually, timing worked out pretty well. I'm pretty, pretty pleased with myself. Uh, <laughs> um, but obviously, uh, I haven't gotten really any questions yet. So we can open it up to some questions here. I know I talk fast. But if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or you're welcome to unmute uh, <laughs> your microphone and ask your questions uh, to Dr. Babbitt directly if you prefer that. Well, um, I do agree with you that there is inequality in spending and definitely um, money is a factor. But I think that having more money doesn't necessarily mean kids get a better education because it's how it's the percentage of the money you have and your values that reflect where you put that money. Sure. So like um, I teach at a uh, at Little Rock School District and I've taught in um, the lower socioeconomic schools. And I've noticed that you know, there's certain discretion that the district gives the administrator and the administrator's values, whether that's, um, you know, technology. Um, at, we have to have new technology like all the other rich schools. And then technology is just a tool. If you don't have the necessary uh, critical thinking skills, you're not going to be smarter just because now instead of a pencil, you have a laptop, like it doesn't mm. correlate. And sure. so I've noticed that even though certain money is given to certain schools, if it doesn't follow the values of the person that's spending the money, administrators or the pedagogy of particular mm. leadership, then you're just right where you started. And sometimes you just can't put lipstick on a pig. Yeah. Well, I mean, but that, that just, you know, I think that's that's important, and um, just I, I certainly am I'm, I'm going. Can to... I say something? Yes. Hi, I'm Kwaisi. I've taught in the Palm Bluff School District, with my, which would probably be considered one of those type of schools that you just um, mentioned. I missed your name. I'm sorry. I'm trying to sc scroll through to find your name, Miss Amy. Um, is it? Sh I, how did I say your last name? I'm sorry. Uh, Miss Amy's fine. Slisher. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. I, you know, I'm, I'm being on saying people's name correctly, but, um, and I agree with you to a certain extent of to where it's like, you can't just order electronics and expect the students to know how to use them. However, the students are typically smart enough to work the electronics, how they are, because they're always on electronics these days, right? From very social media techie, like they know how to go past private websites to get to the websites that they want to get to. The children are very tech savvy, right? Now, as far as with testing and wanting to, a big thing when I was in the classroom was they wanted to use the laptops for testing. However, they didn't want to use the new laptops to let them practice the testing um, assessments on. They wanted to use the old ones that had keys missing and things like that. And I will always advocate and say, how would they be able to test and have adequate test scores or accurate test scores if you won't let them actually practice on the computers that they'll be actually testing with? Um, I think sometimes we don't want the new shiny things to get broken and assume that the children are going to break them because we don't want to take the time to show them how to use them. Yeah, I, I certainly, as far as I, I'm concerned, I will not... Uh even pretend to know what happens in a k-12 classroom of, of any school i'm i'm it's been a long time uh, since i've been there but I, 
but I think what this this raises to me is should we be letting local school districts make these choices? Also, there's a there's a question in the chat, and it's an easy question, so I'm going to answer it. Uh, my school funding numbers, and I didn't give precise numbers because, like I said, those numbers are hard to get, but they're per pupil. Right? This amount of spending per student uh, is the, are the were the figures that I was I was concerned with. Um, so yeah, obviously New York's going to spend a whole lot more because there's a lot more kids. It's per kid. Um, but yeah, so the question is, do we want to have more of a nationally uh, a national curriculum and national standards, or do we want to continue to let states and, and localities make these kinds of decisions? Uh, about marijuana and alcohol, or is the state's interest who, in who sells it about anything other than money? Um, well, obviously money plays a huge role in it, right? I mean, what's happened the, a lot of these liquor laws probably were, when they originally were proposed, were probably, you know, we're going to try to make some money, but we want to make sure that people aren't abusing alcohol. But then now, of course, I don't know how many of you have heard of the Baptist and Bootleggers coalitions, right? Um, if you, if you, I, in, Mag, I live in Columbia County. We had a wet dry vote about ten years ago, uh, and yes, the the some of the churches were very strongly opposed to to it but they got a lot of their funding for their dry campaign from county line liquor stores. So, yeah. Um, and, you know, Arkansas, one of the weird things about Arkansas uh, liquor laws, you can only, a person or a, a corporation can only own one liquor store. Uh, so we don't have chain liquor stores like they do in, I think, every other state, right? You go down to Louisiana and they have, you know, all kinds of chains. Um, even if you federalize education, you will still have semi-autonomous regions, so to speak, at the local level, unless you make it so strict that there's not room to vary at all, and then you have a state. Well, it's clearly you would have definitely have a state's right issue. And again, I'm thinking as a theorist, right? Practically, I recognize that federalizing education isn't really possible, but um, we could certainly do more. Uh, what scares you have people on school boards who are making funded decisions about education that when, when they don't have a clue. Uh, yeah, I was on school board for a few years, but, <laughs> but I hope I didn't, uh, I really tried to have a clue when I was making those decisions. Um, how do I think it relates to the culture wars that we're seeing in society today? I think this is, that's, I think that's a great question. Um, I don't know if you, I hope you can all, everybody can see the chat, right? So somebody like Montesquieu and, and somebody who takes Montesquieu's position would say something like having small republics helps you avoid those culture wars, right? Um, what Madison's view is that, well, if you are in a minority in a locality, um, let's say you, you run the risk of having your rights um, threatened by the majority. And, and so that's, again, I, I think that's really what's, what's interesting here, right? Montesquieu says, um, and, Mo and it's not Montesquieu, I mean, Montesquieu's view is, and I think I want to really stress this, Montesquieu's views were widely shared at the time of the debates concerning ratification of the Constitution. Uh, but yeah, you avoid those differences, uh, you avoid the culture wars um, if everybody is pretty much thinking along the same lines. Uh, but Madison saw that as a problem. And I think that's one of the things Federalist 10 mostly talks about differences in income and differences in how we make our money. But he also mentions religion and he, and he, and he worries about religious minorities being uh, losing um, their freedom of religion to a religious majority. Yeah, and that's what I think culture in what context is, is um, well, if, I think this, that's a really good question, Quasi. Uh, clearly, class and religion were something that uh, Madison uh, and, the, and the framers were thinking a lot about. Um, and slavery, of course, itself, which is different from what you said, uh, it's the elephant in the room, right? Um, it's, it's a huge problem 
many people thought at the time, 1787, that it was it was it was a problem. They 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 basically uh, kicked the can down the road, right? They said we can't we can't deal with this right now. We have we, we're dealing with this other thing. Um, I, I recently over the holiday I saw Hamilton in Memphis, um, and it gets a lot wrong. Uh, among the things it gets wrong is it makes Hamilton into some kind of early abolitionist, which simply, unfortunately, uh, isn't really true. Um, it's a fabulous show, and, and I really enjoyed it, but some of the historical details, it's a musical, uh, is, is what I'll say about that. But yeah, I, and again, I, I, I do think Federalist 10 specifically is really about economics. It mentions religion, uh, but it could be used to talk about any different way that we have various cultural conflicts. If everybody is the same, we don't have those same kinds of conflicts. Um, but we always have to worry if you are the different one in your small, I mean, some of you, I grew up in a small town um, and it's hard to be different in a small town. What different people in a small town wanna do more than anything is get out, right? Uh, to the big city where they can find their people. Okay, well, um, uh, Dr. Babbitt, thank you so very much, and we're not done quite yet for the evening, but thank okay. you for that, that um, fascinating presentation, and uh, thank you all, too, for your questions and your comments. Uh, those are very engaging, and uh, really appreciate those. So I hope that each of you, um, well, thank y'all um you know what what we're doing here is not anything in comparison to what y'all are doing in the classroom every day and again i know you've heard this and heard this and heard this but we at the humanities council truly appreciate the hard work that and effort and under very trying circumstances on what you're doing to teach our students across the state and incorporate humanities in your classroom paul you did a great job so it was nice to hear it from a, a political science theory perspective instead of just facts and figures. Um, I think that is good information that they can take and apply in the classroom and answer questions that their students probably have, you know, about what in the world were they thinking, you know, when, when, when they did all this. So really appreciate the yeah. time and effort you put in to presenting tonight. Yeah, I, I did. Yeah, I mean, what what they were thinking is they're trying to get a deal done. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's I mean, it's it's no different than our legislation le legislation today, right? You got to. It sometimes it gets to be a little bit of a mess. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, the, the making sausage analogy. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So, but again, uh, please reach out if we can help. I really appreciate y'all all taking the time tonight, and we look forward to seeing you at our next sessions. I did drop. Mm -hmm. all that information into a Word document in chat. So hopefully you've had a chance to get a hold of that. Well, thank you for coming, everyone. I, I, uh, I really appreciate your attention and your time. And uh, stay, stay healthy as best you can. Yes, thank you guys so very much. And also remember that the Arkansas Humanities Council offers a number of grant opportunities for educators Thanks again, have a wonderful evening, stay safe, and we hope to see you again next time. Take care, good night everyone.